We are so we are so pleased you're here. I guess I could even put my camera on and say hello. Um, here we go. Hi, great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here for this very important topic. We're, we hope that some of you were here last month when Anna joined us. And if so, welcome back. And to anybody new, um, thanks for coming. Uh, I am here with uh, uh, the team that many of you know already that will be here helping answer questions in the chat. And we will just kind of move along here. We always have a little housekeeping to do. So we um, add this little extra special, uh, what should I say, a little boost for some self-care for everybody before we do any of our webinars. And th these are um, cards from our self-care and wellness set that we offer at Becker's. And I always like to offer a different one just to kind of get us grounded before we get started. So. This card, the most important words you say are the word, are the ones you say to yourself. And the message here is we tend to be really hard on ourselves and always look at, you know, wh why did I do that? Where did I go wrong? It's my fault. And all of that just adds to anxiety and adds to your stress. So it's just a reminder, try to be kind to yourself, give yourself a break, say it's okay. And um, we're all doing our best. So moving on, you will get a certificate of attendance for being with us today. That will come by an email in about, uh, I think, within 24 hours. This session will also be recorded. So if you do need to leave early or if you have a friend or a colleague that was not able to join us, let them know that that recording will be available. We will send out a link to that as well. Anna has been so kind to make available to everybody that's in attendance some excellent resources. So we will give you a link for how to access those at the end of the session. And we hope you hang in there because we will be doing a quick poll at the end. So now I would like to introduce our speaker, Anna. I said a lot of wonderful things about our presenter when she was here just last month. And if you were here, I didn't want to repeat myself. So I found a few, out a few new fun facts I'd like to share. In the past year, Anna has delivered 62 trainings to over 3,000 educators in many states and in many different venues, school districts, Head Starts, universities, community nonprofits, Indian tribal associations, and other settings. She's thrilled that she's able to help educators make authentic connections and learn about the power of creativity in their work with children. But my favorite new information was hearing Anna's response to the question of how she maintains balance after struggling with the same overload that many of us have felt over the last few years. She said, and this is where we um, reference our picture of Anna enjoying that ice cream cone, I've learned to exercise more and enjoy ice cream. Not the whole pint of ice cream I stress eat on a rough day, but the ice cream cone slowly relished as an act of love. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Anna and uh, learn much more. Thank you, Anna. It is all yours. I'm gonna stop my share. Excellent, thank you so much. Wow, that was a beautiful introduction and I, I do love seeing that ice cream cone. That was one uh, that I had just a few months ago. And when I showed I showed that picture to my son, he said, Mom, that is like a pint of ice cream in that cone. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you get lucky, you get a big serving. Um, but anyway, moving beyond beyond ice cream into our topic of today, I'm going to uh, go to our slides and show you what I have prepared for you, which is the let's get it all up here trauma-informed care so leslie you can see that all right are we good? yes all good uh, excellent very good so um moving on to our topic because as leslie said we do only have an hour and oftentimes when i do trainings with teachers because i do uh like to include hands-on quite a bit i usually do a two-hour format um but i know that's not you know becker's always has the one hour format and so um, it's nice for you because then, um, you know, an hour is easier for you to fit into your already busy day. 
Um, but I will wait for the hands-on towards the end because this is important content and sometimes it takes a while to really grasp anything mental health related or trauma related because it gets complicated pretty quickly. Um, anything about social emotional development um, and cognition for that matter. You know, sometimes when you're looking at, at those topics in a deep kind of fashion, it does get complicated quickly. And my job, the way I see my job is to simplify those complicated elements of mental health, trauma-informed care, social emotional learning to simplify them, but retain the essence of what's most important. So simplifying is a, is a difficult task because you don't want to lose the essence. But if we don't simplify as educators, we're not likely to actually apply these principles. Why? Because we're so busy. You know, if something isn't simple and relatively easy to implement, we know that we're just going to go next and pass it by because we don't have the bandwidth left. We're too busy managing a whole classroom of children. Um, we're managing parents. We're managing quality control assessments. We're managing so much that you know everything we do and add to our plate has to be easy to apply. So I hope when you finish this hour here with us, you'll be able to feel like, oh, those were important messages about mental health, stress, resiliency, trauma, but now I have a, an, a, an ability to grasp the essence of those like, like maybe I hadn't before. So let's see, you'll let me know whether I was successful at that. So the first entry point into this topic, I think, is what are the challenges that you're facing today? You, if you're a director, you know, what are your teachers facing? You as a director, you can know, face it all, but if you're a teacher, you're facing the children directly. If you're a manager, you know, you're dealing with the whole uh, agency, the whole school and the families and, and then the stress load that your teachers have taken on because of what they're managing in their classroom. But I won't take I won't take the time to ask you to put this in the chat. Sometimes if we have a two hour, we'll literally stop now and, and let's see what's in the chat. But I'll just ask you to think, constellate in your own mind, what are the biggest behavior challenges that you're facing now? When you go to class and you face the children in your care, what's going on now that wasn't going on a few years ago? I've asked that question to many, many uh, groups of teachers. And the ones, the constellations that I hear the most are aggression, withdrawal, insecurity, and developmental delays. So aggression, you know, I hear the biting, and these are things that you probably, some of you or all of you are encountering today because I hear them pretty much universally. Things like biting, throwing chairs. Um, withdrawal is, you know, just too afraid. If, if, withdrawal and insecurity, if I leave the room, there's a panic attack. Children can't separate from their parents at drop off. Not only can the children not separate from the parents the way they were able to before, but the parents can't separate from the children. They're, because of the COVID pandemic and the lockdown that we've all been a part of, everybody has obviously been a part of that, we are all suffering from insecurity and what is really now uh, characterized and called universal trauma. There's a term that I didn't know before I started studying trauma and maybe you haven't heard it either, but it was put out by the US Department of Education in 2020 and they called it tier one trauma, which is universal trauma. What does that mean? Anyone who has lived through the COVID-19 pandemic. And do you know anybody who hasn't? I don't think so. Uh, because we all, it was a worldwide pandemic and it lasted a long time and it still hasn't really lifted uh, totally. It's, it's been alleviated some, but it's not all gone. We've learned to adapt and at least some of the bigger challenges were over. And we've returned to class, most of us, you know, I think all of us, everyone I know in California, the classes are not, are now on, you know, the classes are in session. Um, but anyway, when you're looking at trauma-informed care um, and why you would add anything to your plate, like if you're gonna say, okay, well, in my school or in my classroom, I know that I need to be trauma-informed because I've heard that. I've heard that we always, the teachers need to be trauma-responsive. Because trauma-informed is one thing, like things like, oh, I, I understand that trauma is universal. I understand that trauma is not just the big, the big severe things like abuse, um, neglect, uh, being in a shootout, being in an earthquake, 
you know, living through severe trauma. Trauma isn't just that. I know that really we all have tier one universal trauma. Um, and so how am I going to proceed with that? Well, what you're looking at is how am I going to deal with those behavior challenges that have resulted from this universal trauma? So what we're looking at when we ask ourselves that question, how am I going to deal with these children who are throwing things? With the children who can't, who, who just have, who have so many developmental delays that they can't follow a two or three step direction. Children who are afraid, children who are acting out, children who are responding to inner uh, a nervous system that is completely, you might say, fried, out of whack, a nervous system that is completely on fight or flight mode at, with the slightest trigger. You know, maybe the garbage collector comes by and there's a, in the road and maybe you can hear the road from your classroom and you hear this big rumble and then a pow because the garbage cans go up in there and, you know, a lot of children will panic now because that reminds them of things that happened, you know, and the fears that the world is not a safe place. So the reason I say all these things is because it's the small things, it's the everyday things that we need to look at now when we think of trauma and how are children responding to those things well they're responding if you look below this little iceberg icon they're responding to being hurt their feelings hurt you know they might have been physically hurt you know because they maybe they have um maybe they're living in poverty maybe they don't have enough food there's so many food shortages and especially with the COVID, so many people lost their jobs so many people um, reverted to previous levels of stress behavior in a more extreme way. So say if, a, if somebody in the family was abusing alcohol, if somebody in the family was a, a abused, was a domestic abuser, they're more likely to have done that during the stress of the pandemic. So everybody has been uh, leaning into those negative uh, coping mechanisms more and more during this stress, again, of the pandemic. So art is where all of that stuff works. And I say art because it's not just any art. It's not making cute little decorations and sending them home a cute little, like, let's see what season is coming up. Spring is coming up. So it's not the spring flower art that you might be doing coming soon or the rainbows. And it's not all the cute little things that the parents like that to see in what they think is art. No, it's not that kind of art. It's the art that's an expression of who the child is. It's the open-ended freestyle art that's really helping children channel and express what's going on underneath the iceberg. And that's the crux of it all. That's why art can help you uh, with the trauma or the stress overload, whatever you wanna call it, too much stress. Art can help you because it deals with what's going on for real in that child's inner world. And as we all know, any problem, no matter whether it's stress overload or universal trauma or any problem, the answer always lies at the root. So adding a different way of using art, you know, adding that to your classroom repertoire, your routine, you know, sometimes you might say, you know, a teacher could very easily ask, I cannot add anything to my routine. I can barely make, make my life balanced the way it is now. Don't give me any more. But the motivational, uh, the, the, the draw for teachers is that it will make your life easier. Because if children feel seen and heard, they have a place when they come to you every day. They come to you every day. And that's the beauty of it. You have repeated experiences with them. So they're coming to you every day. If they can just have an ability to be seen and heard and express who, what's really going on with them, they have a chance of building an attachment with you that feels safe. They have a chance of feeling like their life is in their control at least a little bit. And they have a chance of making connections and really feeling that they have a place in the world. And so that, of course, you would know would make it make your life easier because they wouldn't be acting out as much. They wouldn't be responding because their inner world would have a place to express itself. 
so let's kind of segue into the whole concept of trauma, the field, you know, there's a lot of study that's been done on it and a lot of research and especially since the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, because, you know, life was very stressful, you know, with between the, uh, the computer age and everybody on their cell phones constantly um, and just life moving faster and faster and faster all the time. Life has, has been, you know, there's been a lot of trauma going on when, if you've studied the adverse childhood experiences, um, which I'm sure all of you have been at least oriented briefly on the adverse childhood experiences um, pilot study. Um, and knowing that uh, the ACE score uh, of, of children is, is very much a predictor of their future health and adjustment, and that includes mental health. Um, and there are a lot of a lot of children that have had, you know, relatively high ACE scores, just poverty alone can is, is a point. There's so many neglect, you know, neglect, again, isn't necessarily the severe stuff where you're neglected, where you're not thrown in the basement and left down there, you know, the way those severe neglect stories are. But neglect can be both parents have to work to make ends meet. And when the child comes home, all there is is television. The television is the babysitter. And so that is its own form of neglect because children need what you give them in the school setting, social connections and the ability to feel attached, like you care about them. Somebody's here for me that cares. So when you study, getting back to all these things that we see on, this, on the screen here, um, there are so many methods. There's the pyramid, the lists, and they're all, some of them kind of almost Aren't, they're not the same. So you might say, well, which one am I going to abide by? And what I have done is I paired all those down into three simple things. They're not easy things, but they are simple things. And they are safety, connection, and calm. And because I have just finished writing a book that should be out within the next few months, I spent two years doing heavy research on trauma-informed uh, classrooms and trauma-informed care because I had the wonderful opportunity to write a book with a publisher called uh, Trauma-Informed Art Activities for Early Childhood. So in order to write this book, I had needed to study all those other things, the things that I just showed you here. I read those things. I tell you, it wasn't easy, but I read them all. You've all been to school. You've all taken classes. And sometimes you know, there's a lot of heavy stuff you got to study. And this was all heavy stuff. But I read it all because I wanted to have a, sol a solid foundation. And I found that pairing things down, the common denominator of all these systems was safety, connection, and calm. And I think if, if systems, if theories are not simple, clear, and relatable, I, if you're like me, you're going to think, well, that's interesting, but I'm going to leave it on the shelf. I don't have the way to make it actionable. That's the term that you hear now, these big words, actionable. I, how am I going to put this theory into action? You know, what's the, how is it going to bridge the theory into what I do? Just tell me what to do. Tell me what to do and what to keep in mind as I do it. And those are the three things. So I, you'll have these on your handouts. You know, I wrote out a little bit more, you know, create a safe environment, connection, calm. And in my book, I have, you know, chapters on all of these things, how to do it generally and specifically how to do it with your art materials. So again to segue into how do you do it with your art materials how does art fit in well if you look at this picture here and you think safety well you know children are sitting around together nobody's telling them what to do there's respect and care being shown everybody's you know working kind of independently now not everybody's sitting rigidly in the chair in the same way they're doing their own thing they're connecting and you can actually feel from this picture which is a real picture you know, i took this picture in a at a classroom of three-year-olds um and uh there's a sense of calm there was a palpable sense of calm when i took this picture and that's why i took the picture because i thought oh that's working there there's a good example of art at work and this I took this picture maybe 10 years ago when I was doing a, a site observation. Nobody was talking about trauma-informed care 10 years ago, but it applies now because safety, connection, and calm. And trauma-informed art bridges the gap between mental health and education. 
And why is it that those two fields are so separate anyway? You know, human development involves, you know, learning, it involves emotions, you know, we have thinking, we have thoughts, we have feelings, we're whole beings. Why should education and mental health be so separate anyway? You know, in the world of early childhood, education would always include social emotional health and social emotional learning. In fact, years ago when, you know, the founding of the whole concept of early education was pretty much all social emotional health and the cognitive intellectual stuff happened in kindergarten, but we're getting you ready. You know, it's kind of like the Mr. Rogers kind of thinking, let's just feel safe and like we belong. Like we, people like me and I like people and I can communicate and I'm different from them, but we're both, we're both equals, you know, we're both, um, it's all that social competency stuff. And that's what preschool, you know, was founded on. Um, but it's gotten, you know, now there's so much that's more academically involved and people are thinking, and will I be able to read before I hit kindergarten? Whereas years ago, that wasn't an expectation. And, and it still isn't an expectation in many parts of the world because early childhood was a seen as a place to really develop a strong foundation emotionally and socially. So I feel good about myself. I have a positive a growth mindset. I'm capable and I can get along with others. So of course, that's all mental health. And of course, art and other activities, not just art, but art is a great one for bridging the gap. And because art leaves you a document, it's documentation. You have something to show. It's particularly great. You can keep portfolios. You can observe how a child feels inside by observing what they're creating on the paper. And you don't have to be an art therapist to understand that deeply, or I should say, you can understand it as an art therapist, maybe even more deeper than an educator, but an educator who takes the time to really notice and look at art, the artwork itself will teach you a lot. You don't have to necessarily even get special training. You just have to change your attitude and begin looking and observing and commenting in ways that are appropriate by giving nice open-ended inquiry-based responses and doing less and less and less of the cookie cutter crafts you know you don't have to give them all up a lot of people will say does that mean i can do only open-ended art because i love some of these you know crafts that we do and yeah it doesn't have to be all or nothing the more, but I would say don't call the crafts, don't call that art, you know, they're projects, you can do projects all that you want. Um, in my estimate, that's they're good, they're good for following instructions, you know, um, they're good for sequencing, they're good for mastery of certain skills, but they're not art, they're not about the child, they're not open ended and oftentimes they say absolutely nothing about the child who the child is inside and that's the important stuff when you're thinking social emotional stress trauma informed care who is that child inside I want to make a connection. And through their art children will show you who they are. And that's what you want to be thinking like not not just did my child make that little. Um, pinwheel or that little in that little um, birdhouse or the picture frame, you know, the turtle, the turtle out of the paper plate, you know, that's that's the turtle out of the paper plate is the snowman out of the snowballs that is not showing you letting the child show you they're just saying okay this is an idea that the teacher came up with i'll do my best to make it. So pictures like these, this is Insta Snow, which you could call it maybe a, a uh, it's a science, it's a polymer. But those things are so much fun if you add more sensory element by adding color to your polymers and actually letting them puff up in a child's hands. And that's what I call art. That's like taking things that you might think were science or crafts or loose parts and adding some fun elements to them. That would be you know, probably more sensory play than art, but there is kind of a continuum. So if you're working with toddlers, you know, you're doing a, a, a more sensory kind of play until children can get a really good grasp on some of the tools and things. Um, you know, there's a fine line between when sensory play becomes open ended art. One way to look at that is if you then have documentation of the child's process um, on paper.
And sometimes you can take photographs, like of this, you could take photographs. That could be the documentation. So here's a young toddler um, that doing uh, open-ended painting with liquid watercolor on a tray, on a piece of foil. So you can see all the uh, all that the teacher has done to make this open-ended loose art possible by structuring the environment to uh, to facilitate success and to eliminate her, you know, uh, cleanup. A lot of cleanup can be involved with open-ended up ended things. So over time, you learn to reduce that for yourself because you have your own stress overload. So I love this picture because it shows the brain development and how simple using tools like this, especially the two handed tools, you know, with sensory delays that you see now after the pandemic, um, you know, children have a lot of them are showing pretty severe sensory delays because they haven't had the opportunity to play outside and play with the neighbors and be out in the world the way they were before the pandemic lockdown. So children will uh, elect two brushes, painting with two brushes is fun. And that's great for, you know, midline sensory integration. It's just great for normal development. And so those experience really do create those neural networks that form the brain itself. So that when you do fun things like these, these outdoor sensory activities, you know, big things, and you want to do a lot of big things with with trauma informed art, you want to get physical, because trauma is stored in the body, it's in our nervous system, it's in mus in our muscle system, it's in all of our neck down, it's in our bodies and all the systems that that are active inside our bodies. And, um, you know, these kind of large physical things will help release some of that stress. And uh, it's really good to do outdoor art. Um, I know now with the snow we've been talking about and the heavy winds and you know, you're not going to do it outside um, in all parts of the country. But I did see we had some people from Arizona, and certainly I'm from California, you know, some places you can actually do it almost all year round. But even if you can't dedicating a, a place in your school where that can be more open ended, you know, kind of uh, messy art, a place in your room that's really, really important now after the pandemic is as the pandemic is kind of um, we're working through the effects of the pandemic we're just beginning to help children work through the effects of the pandemic to hopefully get them back to normal we have to normalize all this thing all this setback that we've experienced and especially young children whose whole lives have been um, determined by the pandemic um, we need to help them slowly feel safe and secure so that they can begin to learn so they can get out of their freeze or flight mode and begin to learn and feel safe. So it really does help repair these simple activities like this little pipettes with liquid watercolor and and again if you're looking for vocabulary to maybe in your own mind think how does this happen. You know what what is it that makes that trauma informed well you're offering control independence and safety and any kind of trauma-informed care needs to address those three elements so whether it's universal trauma the what we've all had what you might want to call stress overload you know some people don't even like to hear the term trauma because they're like oh don't tell me about trauma. I don't, you know, I don't abuse my child. You know, trauma has such a, it has, it needs a new branding. It needs a new PR mechanism. Um, because when we hear the word trauma, many of us, many of us will still automatically go to some severe thing that we once read about in the newspaper about some family who traumatized their children by putting them in the basement and practically starving them. You know, there was somebody out here not far from where I live, that got they go they all go into the newspaper those severe cases, um, and oh, it's just drastic. You couldn't even believe anybody would do this to their children. And a lot of times, when you use the word trauma, that's what comes up in people's minds. Oh, there was that severe case I read about. Yeah. So, with the new branding, what we would like to see is it's stress overload, stress overload, more than I can handle more than I can handle without really working on finding solutions, actively, intentionally trying to build resiliency 
by breathing exercises with the kids every day, by doing mindfulness art, by mindfulness exercises, by doing more physical things, by giving them more control as, with you, as you can with art. Because art's one of the few things where children are in control. They are in control. So let's look at um, self-regulating with art, um, you know, because self-regulation is something you hear about so much now because the kids are out of control. They can't self-regulate. And oftentimes we can't either. You know, we're trying. That's why during the pandemic, you know, so many of us gained weight because it's, you know, there was that the, it was just universal. The people say, oh, now I can't fit into my pants because all I did was wear yoga pants for two years. And now I forgot that I, I guess I gained 10 pounds or more, you know, because we're regulating our nervous systems with food. Or we regulate it with our telephone by constantly, you know, if you track how much you just calm down by scrolling through Instagram or something, you know, or you just dive into whatever it might be. It doesn't even matter. You just dive in to just help your nervous system calm down. And hopefully after that, after you realize, well, that's not a good idea. There's some light bulb that goes off and you think maybe it's time to start doing more meditation or doing more yoga or doing more exercise or really trying to manage it so that I get to the root of the problem. And so regulation is a big thing now. And um, low energy, if you think of why, what are we helping children regulate? Either they're, they're frozen, like the world isn't safe. I don't even want to go to class anymore. I want to just stay home. Every, like maybe somebody will breathe on me. Maybe somebody will die. The world is not safe and I need to just stay at home. So those children have a very low energy. It's frozen. And the others, which the ones that give you more of a problem in class because it's harder to manage, are the high energy, the ones that are biting and throwing things and, you know, they're just totally out of control. So those are the two groups of children that you need to find. How's, how's art going to help me? How can something as simple as paint and grounds, how's this going to help me? Well, it will if you begin to sort of reframe it through, the, through this uh, mindset. So um, what my book has lots of these ideas. That's kind of the focus of the book, but I'll, you know, some of the ideas that, that I'm happy to share with you now, um, and I have more on my website, because uh, I love sharing ideas. And they're not all mine. Some of them are mine, but a lot of them are just things I saw over the years. And I said, wow, that's a great idea. It's somebody doing something with art in the classroom. Can I share that with other teachers? And I'll tell you, all teachers that I've ever asked have been happy to share. Because, you know, we, we work in isolation. So this is a great idea. I've never seen one of these. And I, I found it when I was studying for my book. And I loved it. I'm going to make one. I studied how to make it. But it's um, a collaborative sewing table using burlap or that, you know, things that children can stitch into. And a really low table here. And just finding a, a, like a coffee table where you can lift the glass out and have just kind of like a, a shell. And that way, children can actually go underneath it, too. Um, and they can sit around it and it's a nice place, something to put in a quiet corner. You know, we all have some kind of quiet place, a quiet, you might call it a quiet corner, whatever the cozy corner, a place where children can calm down and self-regulate. And you might have books and little plush toys and pillows in there. And those are all great ideas. But another thing to put in that area or, or expand the area is a collaborative sewing table, which you can make yourself and, um, just put out bunches of yarn and there's something very soothing uh, about working with tactile materials like fabrics and textiles. And here's another one on the opposite end of the spectrum, high energy. Those are for your kids who are throwing things. You know, instead of just having an easel, which is great, I love easels. The more easels, the better. But making, just taping up some butcher paper on the wall and uh, putting some nice duct tape, nice firm tape at the top and the bottom, put some mark making materials next to it and just have kids do big spiral motions, big mark making. So let's see, and I have a handout for you that really breaks some of those things down, learning to self-regulate with art, both for the calm, and these are some other ideas, observational drawing with magnifiers here on the left. Get out your magnifiers, get out your leaves, get it, go on a little nature walk, find interesting seed pods, or bring, if it's winter and you can't go outside, you know, you can bring in your own seed pods, um, just interesting things, feathers, shells, 
something natural that children can look at and draw. And those can be nice calming activities. Um, and then handmade books, you know, you can do so much with simple paper books. I've got, I think, four, uh, four pa simple paper books that I like to teach, teach teachers how to teach children. So you can, again, get that reading and literacy uh, messaging in while they're creating, um, you know, drawing onto books. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, art for release, solutions for high energy. In addition to the scribble wall, which I just love, I think everybody should go go to your class and put a scribble wall up tomorrow. Just get your butcher paper out, put it up, put a couple of rolls up, get a basket, put some crayons in it, put some oil pastels, you know, colored pencils, and just have kids do big motions, big motions. And um, so here's some other ideas on the left, collaborative mural with colored tape. So I'm sure most of you are using colored masking tape in your room. It's a great uh, craft activity, a great loose part, a great element of art. It creates a line and you have to pull it out and it makes a noise and it gets all sticky. It's very tactile and you can put it up on the wall and it won't ruin your paint. You can get the low tack kinds of tapes. If you're concerned with paint, the paint on your wall, you can get low tack and Kids can make big things or on the floor. You can decorate it on the floor and that gets your body in to it and it gets a release. And the other is bilateral scribble, scribbling, the one on the right here, or double doodling, which is doing with two hands, something that's done by a lot of pediatric occupational therapists for that sensory integration. So let's uh, go to, uh, I mentioned this once earlier, but let's take a moment to look at the ACE score, which, you know, sometimes, um, I don't know how it is in the state where you live, but I know that um, early childhood started uh, becoming more aware of the uh, mental, the whole idea of mental health and how it affects children and families at an early age. Um, there was a time, maybe 10 years ago here in California, it seems, where uh, you would go to conferences and there would be uh, something on, on, on one of the tracks about the ACE score, the ACE study, and how it affected the children in your classroom and, and their families. And oftentimes that is um, would be especially important when you're working in subsidized childcare um, because poverty is is really uh, it's not certainly not the only factor here whatsoever because the A scores exist in all levels of socioeconomic you know high to low, but it is has been recognized statistically that in impoverished areas of any city there is you know more certainly of neglect if no other reason because parents are usually trying to make basic uh, survival ends you know they're trying to pay the rent they're trying to get food on the table and so there's not the time to read books you've heard all the studies that head start has put out like the number of books that a child has been exposed to by the time they are three is much lower in a lower in a poverty uh, area than it is in an area where children, where parents can afford to buy books. Um, so anyway, uh, that all of which is to say the uh, adverse childhood experiences study is kind of familiar to most people in early childhood education, but so how does that fit in with trauma informed care and the art piece is the is the way I see it fitting in because it gives you a lens to see children's emotional response to all that stress. It lets you see how the household dysfunction is affecting them. For instance, under household a function, you have mental illness. Now, I am a, I am a, uh, I am a, what would you call it? I'm not on the board, but I have been very active with the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and I'm as trained as a family facilitator. So I know a lot of these statistics, and they're pretty surprising. Um, to me, they were anyway, that like one in five adults in the United States uh, has experienced a mental illness in their lifetime or will. And that's a person who has been uh, a debilitating mental illness, not just mild depression, but a, a, an illness that has kept them from functioning well in the world, kept them from jobs, kept them from dealing with family life, that has really been incapacitating. One in five. That's a high statistic. And because there's so much stigma around mental illness, a lot of times you wouldn't even know it. But if you're to look at your classroom and you have, you know, X number of children, or say if you were just to look at a group of 100 people, five of those people 
either now have had in the past, maybe they're controlling it with medication, but they'll have schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, clinical depression, uh, bipolar disorder. Um, all of these are mental illnesses as you know, defined by you know, psychiatrists and the mental health field. Um, but how does that affect a child? If you have a parent with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and what if they're on medication and managing their symptoms? It's good. What if they go off their medication? How does that affect the child? These are all the things that you are experiencing uh, in your classroom. And art can help you get a lens into how children are coping, how they are coping. And teachers, you and the art, open-ended art you do with them, are part of that counterbalance to all these ACEs, these adverse experiences. You are the protective factor. And that was the good thing that came out uh, of the ACE score, the good thing for educator, uh, early education and teachers. Oh, this is kind of bad news. How many kids are going through all these things? But this is the good news. I am going to be someone who makes the difference because I am going to tip the scale. And research has shown that when the adverse childhood experiences tip the scale this way, the protective factors get it back. The protective factors make all the difference. And you are one of those, and the art is one of those. So messy art, you know, is I know many of you did attend the last uh, workshop that we did. And I talked a lot about messy art, but it's a it's a very physical type of open ended art. And I think I I can't remember if I showed this. Let's see if I I think I maybe did show this last. I've got to just run it for a second again because it's such a fun as hard video. As you can. I like it. The way to do so it. So those are three-year-olds. Yes, go for it. And that's the kind of physicality that you want to get when you have kids who are, uh, you know, high energy, you know, really stressed out, carrying a heavy load. And uh, these are the kind of look. They're tearing the paper, and see, it's just taped down. Simple materials, um, but you can do these things all the time. And if you, if you, especially if you don't put the paint out, you can just leave them out. It can be an independent station. It could be a new station that you add to your classroom. So this is basically, you could call it a scribble table. You have a scribble wall, you could do a scribble floor and switch it out because these, you can tape this on the floor. You can do leaf rubbings on the floor. There's a lot of art you actually can do on a big thing on the floor and just leave that out for a while. So here's some examples of, you know, more calming activity, but this had some energy too. This is pounding with the uh, bingo bottles. The kids were making rainforest pictures here. They were drawing with crayons, patting on foam paint, and then doing bingo bottles on top. So that was physical as well. But look at the calm. This was, again, just a totally spontaneous picture that I, uh, a grouping I saw when I walked into this three-year-old classroom. And um, I thought, oh, there is art at work. That's, that's what makes your life easier. That's why, because the children are in better balance. They're feeling safe. They're feeling independent, in control. And that's, those are the kinds of things that over time, you know, you, it takes a while to, to learn how to put these messy things together. Um, if you notice here, this teacher puts newspaper every day. They put newspaper. You can see the newspaper there and see that colored green tape. Her, her aide will put the tape down, tape down the newspaper. They'll always do messy art there every day, some type. Sometimes it's self-directed, just leave it out. Sometimes it's something a little more, you know, prompted. Um, and at the end of the day, the kids know they're all going to roll up the paper and throw it out. So you're working closely with families, you know, teaching families how to do this open ended art and giving them a, a roll, a little, giving them roll up some butcher paper, leave them some crayons to have them go home and have them do it that week and bring in the next week and then hang them up on the wall. There's so much that you can teach them. That art is just not just coloring books. And art is not just making projects. And art is process. So getting back to what I know you all know, but it's good to just reinforce it, that it's always about the process and not the product when you're thinking of art as a language. 
And I'll ask you again because we're getting, uh, it's 1.45 now, so I want to make sure we spend the rest of our time together as, as, uh, as profitably as possible because I want you to feel like you learn things you can apply. Um, but just take a moment to look at these four pictures yourself and just uh, say which one is the one that you shouldn't be doing. The one that's less desirable, the one that's less appropriate, the one that's really all about you, the teacher, and very little about the child. And if you pick the turtle, you pick the right one. Because the turtle is really um, the kind of project that maybe when I first started teaching, I was pretty young. Some of you are probably, you know, young, some of you are old, but um, if you're past 50, um, you, you, we did all these structured things. There was a million things to do with a paper plate and a snowball and, you know, it was just how to make recycled things turn into an object that then everybody would follow you and make the same object. And, you know, we've learned because we've progressed, thankfully. We've learned to talk about mental health. We've learned that social emotional uh, learning is really just a, a part of the whole mental health uh, spectrum. It's the same thing. And uh, we've learned that children following a, a little project that we found in Family Circle or, you know, Woman's Day is really not the way to go. Let's have it be about them, not about something we found for them to do. You can let the babysitter do that. You know, there'll, there'll be places for those projects at home, but they don't need you. You're the professional. You know about, you, you really care about who the child is. So you want to go deeper. And every time I give a longer uh, workshop on these things, people will say, does that mean, you know, I have to do, I love doing the kids love this and the parents love this. And it's like, no, you don't have to give it all up. Even if you were going to be ideal in your open-ended uh, process oriented art, sometimes you are going to do product things because the projects are fun. There's nothing wrong with them. They're fun. They're just not really, um, especially now with all the stress we're under, we don't, that's kind of a waste of time. Honestly, it's kind of a waste of time when we could really be connecting. We want to build connections. Um, but say like this, I thought was a great, uh, I found this, you know, somewhere on the internet, a great example. You can take that penguin that you love to make and everybody, you do it every year. And um, no, just make, loosen up, loosen up on it and make it a little more open-ended and cut out this stuff because you know when I was young and teaching everybody would kind of almost compete for making their bulletin board look the coolest and because I was an art person I would always have a really cool bulletin board and people would say can you help me with my bulletin board and it would be how to make it look like my best art as a teacher so that when the parents brought their children and they would think oh I'm so glad I have your class I'm so glad we got lucky because your class is so beautiful but you know, we've learned that the class really needs to reflect the, the kids in the class, not you. And so it needs to have these things up there. It needs to have them. It's really all about them. And they can get in the zone. They're getting in the zone. This is a little boy painting apples. Totally getting in the zone. So remember, you know, that uh, art is a great way to express emotion and kids have so much bottled up emotion. It's just like we all do, it's not just the kids. And getting to learn your children's language is important, having them do drawings and really looking at them, really looking at the elements, the graphic elements. Because over time, you'll, you'll begin to notice things differently if you start looking at them this way. And saying things, you know, how did you come up with your idea? What did you use to make this part? And what's your favorite part? So that when children say, do you like it, teacher? Does, does, do you like it? That you will, you know, learn to say, even though we're all taught to say, oh, that's so pretty. Or like, you know, because we have that knee jerk reaction. Oh, that's so beautiful. You know, I like it. Um, and, you know, the better approach is to not you know we're not all it's, this is not a uh, contest it's not um you know it's not like one of those contests with who's who's america's got uh, this is not america's got talent um it's it's like oh how did you do that this little part is all smudgy what happened i like how did you get that effect there 
um, what materials did you use here? So that they see you're looking at what they did to make it, not the finished result. And that will only happen when you actually do start looking at that. You know, because you're in a hurry, you've got something else you've got to prepare. And so it's hard sometimes so you, to, to take the time to look. Let me see. Or you can say, I want to see that, but right now I've got to do this. Let's take, I want to see that. Let me look at it a little later. I want to, I don't want to really get to know you better. I want to see what you're up to. I want to see how you did that. Those are the kinds of things you can train yourself to say. How did you make those shapes? Did you learn anything? Did you like this better? Or did you like the crayon better? So here's some questions. This will be part of your handout, the art and inquiry questions. How did you come up with your idea? What did you do to make this? And again, you can train yourself because I too, like all of us, will once in a while you'll say, oh, that's so pretty because it's like it's such a deep root. It's a deep neural pathway. That, oh, that's so pretty. <laughs> and you'll hear parents do it. My child is such an artist. My child loves art. Um, and it's like, yeah. But let's let's look at what do they what are you teaching them by giving them that America's got talent kind of like, yes, you're good. You're you know, you're going to you're going to go to the next level, um, because when then what happens is some that will happen is people say, well, I'm going to send my child to art camp because that they're good at art. And and it should shouldn't be that way. You know, when you hear kids say, I can't do it right or mine doesn't look right. You know, it's a time for you to it's a message for you to say, OK, let's reframe it here. Let's have a little lesson. It's like, well, what is, what is art? Isn't it really about what you think is right? Is, there is no real right or wrong in art. It, it's, your, it's your idea. It's your expression. So another handout that is one of my very favorites, and I hope you put it to use, is what, is, what do you say when children are <clears throat> making art or you're putting out the materials? What do you say to help them with safety, connection, and calm? Those are some ideas that I think are useful. And you'll have it in your handout, so I won't really go over much. But um, you know, under safety, uh, I like helping you, teacher. Can you get me some other minded? You know, I like helping you. What do you need for me? What do you need me to get you? Um, you're safe here. I'm he I'm here for you. Anything you need. What if a child is frozen and they don't want to do anything? They just want to sit there. So you can you know that's fine. You can just sit there whenever you're ready. I'm here for you. If I if you need any other materials, let me know. We'll get through, through this together and going to connection and um, you'll see the rest when you <clears throat> when you get your handout. But this is the bottom of the handout here at the very bottom here. And I wanted to uh, just make that a little bigger to show you that really, if you think what is trauma of art, it's open ended art delivered by teachers whose focus is on safety, connection and calm. So if you set that intention. And really everything you do when you when you get out of your car and go into your classroom walk into the front door if your mantra is safety connection and calm for yourself too <coughs> excuse me you will have the maximum impact and be a trauma responsive teacher so the first step is to redefining art as a protective factor as self-expression to help each child feel seen and heard, because really that's all any of us want, to be seen and heard. I see you, I hear you, and what you say matters to me. That's a line from Oprah Winfrey, and a beautiful line. What she has said is what the one most universal need of all humankind is to have I see you, I hear you, and what you say matters to me. And that is the language that art is providing for children. They can't explain to you how they're feeling. They don't have the de words. Developmentally, they're not ready to put it into words. They know they have big feelings. The picture books you read them about big feelings will help them begin to identify those emotions, have names for them, and understand them, and realize that they're not the only one that has big emotions, so they'll feel less alone, and so that they can feel seen and heard and in doing that you develop more more real relationships and intimate relationships and that attachment that we know that that we all need so a little list is you know just keep it open-ended notice and comment have things for high and low energy practice what to say and avoid empty praise you know no more what a pretty picture 
read social emotional books about feelings and make art and develop your own creativity so that you get back in touch with how good it feels to be in that creative zone. So here's my newsletter, my, my website, I should say. I do a monthly newsletter that's free. You can download it here. And um, I never send you a spam or any other email. I really don't send much at all. I just send once a month, I write up kind of what the best thing that I came up with and heard from teaching and learning from teachers that month. And then I have a lot of free handouts there. So, and there's the book that I have coming up and other teacher training, and we're going to send it over to Kathy to do some Q&A and close us out. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, so many great comments, so much good content, and um, it, we did really run out of time to work with our materials, although I really enjoyed <laughs> playing with my leaves while Anna was, <laughs> was talking, and I found that a very nice sensory experience. But um, some quick questions that I think people might want answers to is, well, actually, some comments. Um, somebody said maybe the children can start to learn to comment on each other's artwork, which I thought was a really nice thing ah, to start to foster idea. that. Yeah, and um, I know one... One slide early on, I think a lot of us were really fascinated by the burlap burlap project. Yeah, but we couldn't cool really idea. see, Anna, how were they actually getting the yarn through the burlap? What well, the burlap, if you've worked with burlap, um, which I have, um, it's very loose. So, and if you have a plastic needle, if you're working with children, you usually are going to use either, they're, they're both easy to, to buy, and, um, plastic needles, which do bend, or in what's called... Um, it's if you go to a, a fabric store, they'll have the big needles that are made for, I don't know, some kind of, they're metal, basically. Metal or plastic are the two choices. And because burlap is uh, forgiving, you can put it under and over. You'll be able to find that it goes under and over. So you teach pip kids to tie a big knot or not. You know, they just go under and over. And um, yeah, I was fascinated with that. And I actually started looking around at thrift shops because it's not so easy to find a table. In the old days, you would have these glass tables. You could lift it out. Then it's just perfect. You could yeah. saw the legs off to make them a little lower maybe. But a lot of times coffee tables are low already. Yeah. You know the, But I did find something on Ikea that, um, that I thought I could adapt because I want to make one myself. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, I think that was a really cool idea. And we, we know teachers are so creative that they will definitely figure it out. Yeah, you'll figure it out. I'm, I'm going to uh, throw my um, screens, my uh, share one more time just because we need to do our poll. So I hope people can hang in a little bit. Take just, um, just a quick minute to respond to our poll, please, which I'm going to put up right now. Three three questions. How would you rate today's webinar? These are anonymous. So if you could just quickly give us answers to these three basic questions. Number two, was the information valuable and applicable to your work? And number three, would you recommend this webinar to others who teach or care for young children? Uh, these answers help us decide if we're on the right track with our topics, with our presenters. It's really important to to get a good sense of what uh, works for you and what is meaningful. We have a very responsive group today, I'm glad to see. Mm, right. Maybe it's because people are starting to get hungry. It's oh, well, it's <laughs> over on the East Coast. It's almost dinner time. But just another yeah. couple of minutes, and I think we've, we've got some really great responses here, and I'm very appreciative for that. And, you know, we could, in theory, do uh, something that was defined more as hands-on. Like, we could, uh, if people wanted that, you can put that in the chat if that's of interest to you. You know, do uh, hands-on experiences with trauma-informed art so that you could um, really focus more on that other part of it. Okay, good. I'm just going to end the, the poll for now and um, do a, a quick wrap-up. On what we would like to share. Um, we are excited about Anna's book that will be coming out. It will be in our upcoming 2024 catalog, which was coming out um, mid-February, and it will also be on our website as soon as it is available. And it looks like um, the publishers, you know, they, they just kind of have these ways of controlling our lives. So they um, have pushed it back to maybe April now, I think is the last thing Anna heard. So stay tuned for that. Um, please remember this is the link so after this session, please um, check out these 
incredibly resourceful uh, documents that Anna provided for us. And in an interest in staying to our time, please, we always like you to know about the next webinar, which is coming up pretty quickly. We managed to fit in two this month. So January 23rd, we are having warm up with winter story times. So, um, and I think Terry got that up on our website. So you can jump on now and get registered for that. As always, we want to thank all of you for being here. Thank Anna for just fitting so much in in a short amount of time in such a relatable way. I think that that really is the key word that Anna really makes this information very relatable for us and something that we can do tomorrow. And I, I agree with that approach, which is just get that butcher paper up on the wall tomorrow. I mean, it's not something we have to think about and read more about and how do I do it? Just make it happen. Um, it really, I loved, you know, that that whole idea of big motion with art. It's a whole different way to look at art. And it's really important that we um, offer children those opportunities. There again is our link at the bottom to get all the resources that are available to you. Any additional questions for us? We'll take a quick look at the chat, see if we're missing anything. I love ah, look that somebody, that. Put, somebody yeah. put use a crochet needle for the burlap. That that's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, that would work perfectly. A crochet. And Karen, um, I'm not sure if my sound just went out, but Karen said she's definitely putting paper up on the wall or the table tomorrow. So that's that's fantastic. Okay, we have folks that are going to look into the next webinar. They really appreciated the importance of this topic. And I, you must have done a great job, Anna, because I don't even see any more questions. Uh, well, here's a question. Is this recorded so I can watch the video again? <laughs> Love yes. that. Yes, it okay. is recorded. And we will be sending out a link to that recording probably tomorrow. You'll see that in your inbox. So check for that. Um, and Paige said this was super amazing. So listen, we appreciate you, our listeners, so very much for being here, for being so responsive, for having the energy and the enthusiasm you bring to this, um, to our webinars. We just think it's wonderful and we enjoy very much sharing these times with you. So thanks again. Everybody have a good afternoon, a good evening. And Anna, we'll look forward to working with you again. We'll keep the chat up for a few more minutes if people want to just continue to uh, chime in. Alexandra, I'm just seeing your note and you asked what were the materials for. Uh, we did say at the beginning that we were going to try to get to them. Uh, we had a lot of content to cover today. So we were so conflicted about taking the time to do the actual hands on, which we did do at the last session um, versus just get as much content as we could fit in within the hour's time. So um, I think I heard from Anna that we might be able to offer you some ideas for how you can use these materials on your own, but I'm sorry we didn't get to use them in today's session.